Thank you for listening to the BJJ Brick Podcast. We'll be bringing you Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and good times. We hope to flatten your Jiu-Jitsu learning curve, help you get the most out of your grappling ability, and meet your goals both on and off the mat. Welcome back to the BJJ Brick Podcast. Uh, This week, we have episode triple three, 333. And today is a topic episode. Uh, What that means is once a month, we do not have a guest. We just talk amongst ourselves. And this week, we're going to talk about how to bounce back after injury. And uh, I think that's something I'm a specialist at. I've been a black belt in bouncing back from injuries for a long time, but I guess I probably trained through injuries, which is maybe not the smartest thing, but we'll talk about that here. Um, I've got my uh, co-host, Byron Jabara, Joe Thomas with me today. And, uh, you know, a lot of people have said uh, when they look at Byron, he looks a little bit like Bob Ross. And uh, that reminds me of a quote from Bob Ross. All I need to paint is a few tools, a little instruction and a vision in your mind. Joe, what do you think about that quote? Well, if you're not carrying a very big tool bag, you're only going to have a few tools anyway. Um, but you know, it, it does relate directly to it does relate directly to jujitsu. You don't have to know the whole catalog of jujitsu techniques out there in order to have a good time, have a good role, and be moving forward in jujitsu. That that actually is pretty applicable, isn't it, Gary? You need a few tools, you need some good instruction, and probably most importantly, you need some vision. And once you get to that point, you can start rolling and moving forward in jujitsu. It's funny you say that, Joe, because uh, I was talking to a guy yesterday. And telling him, really, the only submissions I have are a Kimura and a straight ankle lock. That's uh, basically what I use. And and this guy was telling me how he has this, 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 this. And, uh, you know, a few, to- few tools have got me back. But like you said, a vision, too. Uh, you know, if I just have a couple tools and, and no vision uh, of where I want to go, um, it's not going to help a lot. But uh, Bob Ross, the guy's a genius and uh, just... Not just in painting, but you can take this quote, like you said, and uh, it's uh, very applicable to jujitsu. Well, and his worm guard was fantastic, too, so don't. <laughs> you know, he had a good tree guard. Um, you know, did, he painted trees in like 96% of his paintings. Yeah, I like this quote a lot. You know, we had one last week from Bob Ross, and then this week, and it. All you need to paint is a few tools, a little instruction, and a vision. And I like how where you took it, Gary. You don't need to know everything, especially when you start off. But we've seen people compete and have very limited games and do very well as far as if you can get it to your game, keep it in your game, you're, you're going to be able to, to really have an advantage there. And, you know, just to take this like on the big stage, when, when Gordon Ryan, you know, that... Uh, I don't know, four or five years ago, whatever, when he first came, he was, he was a leg lock specialist. He didn't have a, a real uh, broad game as far as being able to do a lot of different things. And people were just complaining. All he does is leg lock. All he does is attack his heel hooks. All he does is, is, is you know, roll around and, and entangle my feet. Yeah, but he's doing that. <laughs> so you don't have to know. Jujitsu is intimidating. There's so many things to learn. There's so many positions, so many submissions out of each position. But it's like a tree that branches that keeps branching and branching. And, but uh, it's just learn a few of those, get those down really well, and then learn ways to, no matter where you are, to get back to those uh, tools that you have to work. So if, if you want to be a spider guard specialist, you need to be able to get, you know, from standing to spider guard, you'd probably pull guard, from guard to spider guard so if you're whatever guard you're in half guard you need to be able to find ways to get to that spider guard if someone has you in mount how do you get to spider guard from there well what's your plan you you may not prefer to roll them over so you're on top you might prefer more of a shrimping escape to where you recover your guard just lots of ways and in all this is just it simplifies your jiu-jitsu if you're in an area that you're confused Anytime in, in Jiu-Jitsu, it's like, man, I don't know what's going on. I don't know what I should be doing. Look for ways to get into positions where you are familiar, and that way you're at least trying to do the right things. You know, Byron, I like how you say that, and, you know, I'm going back to the spider guard. I know that's your specialty. And, no, you know, it's not. Got, I have a terrible spider guard. 
you've got different ways, you know, to get to the your moves from there. You know, like every time I've caught in your spider guard, you always throw up the black widow. And Ooh. if the black widow doesn't work, you go right to the brown recluse. And uh, so, you know, I'm fighting off a black widow. Then I got to fight off the brown recluse. And then you go right to the funnel web. And uh, normally the funnel web is deadly. But, uh, you know, I you you've got it, you know, passed to go to each one. So, uh, yeah, your spider guard is phenomenal. Gary, I think people are wondering if you even know what a gi is at this point. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was thinking, though, when you're talking about Spider Guard, how come moves off Spider Guard aren't named after spiders? I think we need to start this. Not yeah, you know, never... it's like it would be perfect to go right into the brown recluse. Yeah, and there are some that spider names are cool. Funnel web, like, like yeah. all the ones you named were cool. Black Widow, man, that's a cool yeah. name. It, it probably involves, I don't know, probably racking the guy sleep. a little bit, maybe. Yeah. Um, put you to sleep. You know, the brown recluse, uh, you know, will uh, destroy your skin. You know, will eat away out of you. You know, kind of like ringworm. The, <laughs> the, the, this should be a thing. Yeah. We all to get this this thing started here is to Gary to make a uh, spider guard instructional. We just put up on YouTube free of charge, and the, we used to do those audio free audio books that we were working on and never actually made. Just that as would a be gag. a good one. Yeah. And, and and Gary, yeah. you just show normal spider guard techniques, but name them after spiders, and boom, it's going to be wolf spider. That's a good name. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wolf spiders are bad, man. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, when I was a kid, I got bit by one of those suckers on the neck. Ah, oh, that nice. hurt. That hurt. But they're not that poisonous. I, tarantula. Man, you know who we're onto tarantula? something here, guys. We'll just stay real the whole you know show I, and talk about spider. Cars. You know who I like to roll with? Daddy Long Legs. You know, I got all <laughs> sorts of uh, ankle locks against that person. Uh, but with the long legs, uh, you know, with Spider Guard in particular, guys that have long legs and gals, they're easier to kind of off balance you. Just that it seems to be kind of a long leg. Thing. Can you imagine going against a daddy long legs? How many hooks out that long leg could put into you? They got like twelve legs. I think it's eight. Okay, <laughs> sure it's not twelve. <laughs> okay, Gary. well the ones I've been rolling with have twelve. I, I just ask Joe. <laughs> crabs have twelve legs. <laughs> <laughs> no, Byron. Crabs have eight and two pinchers. There you go. Those are Gary. arms. Well, we hopefully have. <laughs> Who would have thought the Bob Ross quote would get us to talking about crabs and spiders? Byron, that's what happens when you make me wake up earlier for a podcast. Yeah, we're we're doing this thing at eight a.m. Sunday morning. Gary, you're man. We appreciate you getting up early, and you're. This is the day you could sleep in. Yes. Yep. Thank you. you, you it just shows some of the dedication that's that's on this team here, and uh, we know if you're new to jiu-jitsu that you feel like you're super dedicated and you're having a good time but there are many bumps and hurdles along the way that can that statistically that first year is super tough and that's where people get knocked off of jiu-jitsu every person that buys a white belt you know that's wearing it in a year i don't know what the numbers are but it's not very many you know it's it's a rough process and everybody who buys that white belt and does that first couple of trainings or that first month or two is having fun but just things happen along the way that make it uh, a diff- more difficult journey than anticipated. Joe, what could somebody do to help make that journey a little bit smoother? Uh, read a book or or maybe listen to a book. That would be easier. You could do it while you're driving in your car. You could do it to them from uh, class. Uh, yeah, you should look at uh, check out Byron's audio book, Your First Year in BJJ. And uh, yeah, if you don't mind listening to Byron for, what is it, Byron, an hour and a half, two hours? It's about uh, two and a half hours. <laughs> Good. Good luck, guys. So where can they find it? Uh, go to the, the BJJ Brick shop. There's uh, show notes there uh, on your phone where you're listening to this now. And one of the links is to the shop. Or just go to the website, bjjbrick.com, and there's a shop button. A few audiobooks pop up, and, and it's one of them. And it'll help you get through that first year of training, not just get through it, but with a smile and um, hopefully reaching your peak ability. As far as on the time of the mat, you'll reach your peak ability. You know, it, we never really get there, <laughs> but but feel like you didn't waste that year and, and starting all over in year two. So, yep, it's in the it's in the shop on the website and uh, check it out, my friends. 
it's, it, hopefully it'll help you out. Uh, Joe, we have an off the mat lesson. I think that's in, uh, usually falls in. It, so here's how we do this. <laughs> Let me just, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> before, before the show starts, we, we kind of, Hey, here's the quote. We talk about it. We'll talk about the article and, you know, we just kind of briefly run through the show. And it's always like, does anybody have an off the mat lesson? And then, so when I have them, I, ha- I always do one. Like if I have it, I'll do it because I don't feel like I do it a lot. Gary is like, that's silent. <laughs> and uh and Joe's like, I can no, do I one. Had one this time. Do you no, really you guys No, nope, I'm not t- giving it. Yep, he's saving it. That's not real. S- save it for next week, Gary. I would I'm like- sick next week. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're recording next week's episode right after this one. G- Gary's never had a sick day in his life. <laughs> <laughs> the whole week. So Gary, I would be impressed if you could pull out an off the mat lesson right now. But I think it'll be Joe today. Okay. I think we should go with Joe. <laughs> <laughs> Rock, paper, scissors. Ah, you won. Go ahead. Okay, it's me. You know, um, we talk about off-the-mat lessons, and uh, this week I have a really good one. And uh, my off-the-mat lesson is always defer to Joe. Joe, you're up. <laughs> okay. Hey, uh, last week I had the opportunity to talk to uh, Derek Fury. He's writer and director of a new movie out called Lion Killer. And I kind of want to expand on something that he told me. He was talking about uh, shooting just a, a small individual scene in a movie and, and how much more work goes in the, into that than, you know, maybe people like us would realize. Um you know, you might have a day of filming into a five-minute scene, and you might have had a week or two of uh, prep and planning leading up to that. And as the f- director, um, you're really happy with it. But sometimes you're so deep in a project that your vision could get skewed a little bit. So it's important that you have a few people that can give you honest feedback. And he was talking about, you know, some of the people that he knows that he might ask for feedback from our actually like the competition they're going to be critical they're going to be negative and then of course your friends are just going to tell you oh that's great you're the best so it's not always easy to find those couple of guys and um but when you do you run things by them you get their feedback and um he said sometimes uh you just you have something that you're in love with and you get some feedback and you just have to leave it on the cutting room floor to speak so to speak and uh start and start over and go a different direction And I was thinking about both those two things with jujitsu, and and one is it's really helpful if you can get two or three people around you that can give you good quality feedback. So that's the first thing. But the other thing is um, sometimes we'll invest a lot of time going down a certain path in jujitsu, and uh, and then find out that it's it's not what's going to work for us and we just have to take maybe six months or even a year's worth of focus on something and leave it on the cutting room floor, so to speak. And I was thinking about you, Byron, because I think this relates a little bit to our topic episode this month. Our topic episode is bouncing back after injuries. And I just don't think that you can talk about bouncing back after injuries without saying something about injury avoidance in the first place. And in jiu-jitsu, oftentimes our injuries are just, you know, wear and tear injuries and, and repetitive use injuries. And Byron, weren't you at one point a triangle specialist off your back? Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I don't I know. Think, Specialist I think is, a, it is probably a bit of a uh, stretch, but I really that was my main thing was triangle choke, pull guard, and triangle. So I, th- I think that's a really good example of this. And, and and tell tell me about the transition. At one point, you decided it, it was just going to keep jacking your neck up, or what? It was my it was my lower back, and I could do. Um, so the <laughs> I, w- I would do a lot of triangles in a training session, and. You know, out of out of ten triangles, they were good, but twenty triangles, or the the amount of triangles I would do in a week, I would occasionally get stacked, and 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 I had ways to prevent getting stacked and and that sort of thing. But occasionally, you know, like anything, there's more than one way to to deal with your opponent, and and some people could stack me in a way, or sometimes I would just get stacked in a way that would kind of tweak my lower back, and then having uh, you know reoccurring injuries with my my lower back injury is probably a stretch as well just it was sometimes really sore and it would kind of slow me down to work a little bit as well it's like you know what i think i just need to change and just stop doing this because i looked i kind of reviewed my uh my my past and basically all of my lower back uh inflammation caused from 
triangle chokes um, that were getting stacked. And I could have maybe looked more into avoiding getting stacked, but I don't think you could ever totally prevent everybody from stacking you. And so I was just like, well, I'll just uh, do something else. <laughs> and and a nice thing for me is that Uma Plata, which is seems to be a lot less common, plays nicely off of a lot of stuff I was doing uh, in the triangle. And uh, it, it, I'm off to the side. There's no stacking on this. And I have yet to either hurt myself or anybody else doing Uma Plata. So it has been a, a good uh, transition. Although I know I do miss some submissions. And I've done a few recently. I'm, t- I'm trying to bring it back a little bit and cautiously. And then <laughs> my, my new strategy is to just uh, not deal with the stack. So if they if they start to stack, I don't triangle any. I just abandon that and, and quickly transition to possibly Uma Plata. But yeah, I didn't mean to go into that deep. But yeah, I changed my game. I, I wanted to stay on the mats. I wanted to be healthy off the mats. So I just like, well, quit doing one of my favorite things and do something else. Yep. So so yeah, it's unfortunate and it's not always easy. But sometimes we invest a pretty good bit of time and effort into a certain direction. Um, but you're a great example of this because you also have talked about your Evergard phase. So um, yeah, sometimes <laughs> we just have to leave I keep, it on I the keep abandoning massive parts of my game. <laughs> you know, though, you think about, you know, keep abandoning massive parts of your game. You know, it's really, you know, you, let's go with your rubber guard stuff. And I know you've said it really didn't work and, uh, you know, it's holding you back. But I really do feel that it helps you in the long run. Um, you are going to be more familiar with it. You did put yourself down some different paths. You did, you know, figure out how to make your body move in different ways. Um you know, so even though it is something you abandoned and, you know, you spend a significant amount of time on it, I, I do still think that helps helps a person, you know, in the long run. Yeah. You know, Gary, that that's a great point. I, I probably uh, misspoke when I when I say leave it on the cutting room floor because people when they're filming, they don't throw nothing away. They keep all that footage and, and you never know. They might a little piece here, a little piece there they might use later or just the process of filming it was good for them. And I agree with you, Gary, it's the same way with jujitsu. I don't think there's any wasted time really. Uh, it, you, you move a different direction, but some of the things you learned going down that other path are going to stay with you. So it, th- this is our topic episode here, bounce back after an injury. And I think we've said a lot of our ideas as far as how to come back from an injury, uh, dealing with injuries. I mean, we've had 333 episodes. We've talked about injuries before. So to make this a little bit different and have this be, um, maybe have people on here smarter than us that are actually actually on here. Well, I thought we'd import some articles from other sports because every sport is going to have people dealing with injuries and see how they deal with them and see how that they make comebacks. And, uh, I think that there's a lot to learn from these other sports. So we're just going to take these in order, Byron? Might we're as well. We're going to start with eight tips to uh, make a strong comeback to running after an injury. So it's a good article. Um, a couple of things that I like in here. Well, let me start off by saying I think it's a second point. It says don't slack on physical therapy, which – would assume that you went to a, a doctor. I don't think it really says it in here much, but I'd say my first uh, uh, tip is if you're actually injured, not just hurt or sore, uh, see a doctor. We don't do that often enough. But then don't slack off on the physical therapy or whatever the doctor prescribes. If you see a doctor and they tell you you need to stretch, you need to do A, B, and C, then take their advice and stick to it. I think that's so. I think that's an area where we all fail a lot. Joe, I agree with the doctor and the advice. We fail. Uh, a lot of times we think that we are smarter. I mean, we want to get back into the game because it's something we do. And um, and we try to oversimplify everything. Think, hey, you know, this doctor doesn't know what he's talking about. Uh, he doesn't do jujitsu. And, and we do jump back too quick, which le- leads to more injuries. I also like the next point right below this. And it's... Uh, post-injury comparisons. It says, after a long break, you need to check out any and all comparisons to your runner self pre-injury. And man, I think that's so key in jiu-jitsu. 
I've seen guys off the mats for a few months for whatever reason, and they come back, and it can just be so discouraging. You, it, oftentimes, your cardio is not what it was. Your your reflexes, your action time isn't what it was. Your sensitivity to, to the situation, and it can be real discouraging. So, when you come back from an injury, um, just recognize that your teammates have gotten better. You had some time off, and just you know, start pecking away and, and, and don't don't worry that the guy you used to tap every class is now getting some taps on you. Just just keep training. Yeah, that's a good point, Joe. And we're going to have several articles this episode. We'll put links to all of them in the show notes. This is on active.com. And uh, another one that, that uh, Caitlin has in here is one day at a time. And uh, she says being patient is tough. And, and I agree on that. I think we all would like to get better as quickly as possible. But when you're coming back from a serious injury, uh, be patient. And rather than focus on the possible months or time you have ahead of you that is going to be, you know, subpar performance for a little while, um, just do one today. I'm going to do today. And I'm going to get get that. I'm going to try to do my best or I'm going to be, you know, my best to recover and do a little bit of training, whatever you're doing. Um, but just that one day at a time. She says, set mini goals each week and check them off as, as uh, the benchmarks, uh, as you hit those benchmarks. So, uh, you know, yet again, Gary's a big fan of setting mini goals. And, uh, and that keeps you from getting frustrated from looking up. Like at you know, two months, you'll be healed. But man, that's so far away. Uh, maybe today I'm going to, you know, focus on not feeling uh, you know, like building a little bit of strength in that injured area or, or developing a different part of your body. Yeah. Uh, Byron sets many goals. Gary sets mini goals. Oh, I, <laughs> they're, they're tiny, but they're still goals. You know, I can't believe you guys have skipped over the very first, uh, point from Caitlin, the slow build. And, uh, this is something that, hurts me uh, a lot of times um, I don't slowly build myself back up and you know I know we've kind of talked about this point and other topics there too but I try to jump back in full force um, you know slow build and what Caitlin says the second you get the green light does not mean you know going back to where you left off um, it is going to take you some time to get there if you you know, not fully healed and you're slowly working your, you know, she's talking about running here, working your miles back up. You're going to stress your injury, you know, probably too much and re injure yourself, re aggravate the, uh, the injury. So, uh, slowly build yourself back up, uh, to where you were before. Don't jump in, you know, full force, two feet, you know, just going crazy like a wounded cougar, slow down a little bit. Uh, you know, maybe if you were running, you know, 10 miles before, maybe the first time out, run a half mile. Uh, may sound very, very small, but, um, you know, same thing with, with rolling. We jump back into it. Instead of rolling seven rounds, maybe roll one round or maybe two rounds with a really uh, technical higher belt, somebody who is uh, where you're not going to explode through everything. Uh, so that one actually is my favorite point right there. Yeah, it's it, and here we get into a little bit of, uh, the differences between sports because if you're running, you can control uh, how fast you're going, the effort you're putting in, how far you go, all those things. And so if you're nursing an injury, you you could dial back those different categories. Um, for jiu-jitsu, it's a little bit different because there's another person involved who, who is actively you know, working with or against you is, as you're on the mats. And so really choosing that training partner is a big part, like Gary was saying, of being able to um, come back at the rate that you feel is best. So instead of it being able to just the distance you run or the speed you're running, you need to be, have the right person to train with. And it might mean that, you know, if there's 10 people in class, only three of those people are going to be the ones you're going to train with today. And you only get to roll three rounds instead of, you know, four or five or whatever you're used to rolling. Um, but, uh, I think, I think the people that you could tell, Hey, I'm just, my shoulder has been sore. Um, do you mind if I work on, you know, this position or, or something in particular? And they listen to that, um, that those are people that, that could really be a big help. All right, well, let's, let's go to the next article here. It's on uh, shiftmovementscience.com. And, uh, and this is a pretty deep thing here. You know, this is definitely something that you, I'd recommend you read. 
Um, it's just it, it approaches injuries in a different way than anything I've seen in the in the jujitsu community. He uh, talks about um, pain science. And, and, and why your body is, is hurting sometimes and, and how that affects you. Um, but the article is called Three Reasons Why a Gradual Return to Gymnastics Following an Injury is Key. Pain Science, Tissue Adap- Adaptation, and Psychology. So uh, that's what this article is going to talk about. Yeah, the, the guy that wrote it uh, is a lot smarter than us. I don't know a lot <laughs> about pain, pain science, but uh, in reading the article it got me to thinking about the old adage, no pain, no gain. And uh, I think especially when you're recovering from an injury, but just in general, you got to be careful with that because there's a difference between discomfort and pain. And if you're coming back from a shoulder injury or something and a certain movement is causing you pain, that's not something probably that you should push through. There's a difference. And so uh, if you go out running in the morning and it's 5 a.m. and it's 32 degrees and that cold air hurts your lungs, then it's good to tell yourself no pain, no gain, and to, and to push through it. But, um, yeah, so so that's kind of my takeaway from this particular point. Yeah. Um, so in, in gymnastics, just as our – I don't think any of us can do <laughs> gymnastics at any significant level or ever have, but um, they, they, they do generate, and it's talked about in the article, some pretty extreme pressures on their body and, and some pretty crazy movements and also some repetitive movements. So there, there are a lot of things here that, 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 that are pretty crazy. Just as an example, <laughs> guys, um, I, at, at work, I, I made a, a medical alarm on uh, a person at a, uh, at a gym who was doing gymnastics a teenager, and he was doing, I think he told me, a double flip, which is crazy. The amount of... Front of, flip. Of, of height. Yeah, front flip. It, the amount of height and the amount of speed you have to have rotation uh, on that. And when when he landed, he his knee contacted his forehead, and it dented his forehead. Um, it gave him a skull fracture. His own knee gave him... Gave, I can't even touch my knee to my forehead. I tried it. Um, it, it doesn't even work. I, like as, I, it, They don't even line up. I hit myself in the chest. Anyway, uh, but that's crazy amount of pressure um, that's being generated. You think of like MMA, the guy's punching and the guy's kneeing each other or whatever. Um, the amount of speed he was going, and he's not a heavy... This is, this is a, 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 a... I don't know if he's 15 or so. Young and light, but... Just all that speed and pressure. Um, the gymnastics people get hurt all the time. <laughs> and, and so they have really tried to perfect the way to bring uh, people back and, and, and bring them back successfully. And, and looking at pain and, and, and listening to your own body is a big part of that pain science as far as like, okay, my ankle's sore. Is it sore because I should be off of it? Or is it my body warning me that I need to be a little bit careful with it right now? Um, and that's, that's a big part of it. If you every night you're going home and you're feeling a little bit more sore than you were the day before, you're probably headed off, you know, in the wrong direction as far as any kind of recovery. Um, if you're a little sore here or there and it changes, that's probably not such a big deal. But uh, all of these um, these people, and it's I think it's a little easier. Um, so, so as adults, and and a lot of us doing just who are adults, that a lot of us listening to this podcast are adults. Um, it's easier just to say, you know what, I'm going to heal. I'm going to just not get it treated or seen. But um, I think a lot of times with kids, when they get hurt or injured, their coach is like, hey, you need to go to the doctor. The parent, you need to go to the doctor. And they just go because they know it's the right thing to do. And so just as a total spin, on, it's not in the article at all, but if if you had this injury, and, and but you were a kid, would a, a parent tell you, you probably should go to the doctor, <laughs> uh, Gary? Like... It's, uh-huh. Yeah. It, so a lot of the times we don't make the best decision for ourselves. We just kind of, I'll just ignore the pain and hope it's okay. But if it was a kid, we would say, hey, let's get you in and get you seen. And um, they just don't have the choice. They don't have the, you know, if that's what mom or dad says I need to go do, that's what they do. Um, and it's probably for the better overall treatment of the athlete is to get seen by a medical professional more often than we do in jujitsu. Yeah, not not only that, but uh, Byron, you got me to thinking. Just, just even treatment at home, putting putting ice on something, elevating something. I'm horrible about that. I'll I'll start complaining around the house that you know this or that sore from jujitsu last night. My wife will be like, "Well, did you ice it?" 
did you do anything? It's like, eh, no, I just thought I'd complain about it instead. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, get, get into something early. If you twist your uh, ankle running or, or something, you know, getting it elevated, getting some ice, Byron, you know more about this than I do. But the, the things that you're supposed to do, the quicker you do them, the better off you're going to be. That is a good point, Joe. And And I'm like you. I will do it maybe once or twice, but I don't keep doing it, you know, for a couple of days. And, uh, uh, you know, it's not just do it once, uh, you know, the injury is not going to heal itself from one time of elevating it, put some compression on it, you know, put some ice on it. Um, uh, you have to keep doing it. And, uh, that's one of the big things I think we lack also. In this article under that first point about pain science and the, in the graded exposure, um, it, he says, with an injury and pain experience present, the brain may start to associate certain movements with a danger signal and create pain to the injured or endangered area as protection. So, uh, he and he goes on, he doesn't advocate ignoring pain, but just know um, that sometimes your brain will kind of help you protect yourself and say, hey, don't do that, that hurts. <laughs> um, I think that and probably the same in gymnastics, some of us will just avoid certain things on the mats in jiu-jitsu. And so if you can imagine if you were going to hesitate before doing a flip, you probably won't do the same flip with as much force and, and proper technique because a little bit of that caution, a little bit of fear is popping in your head versus the person who just does the 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 flip or the whatever they're doing with um, without that uh, danger signal in the back of their head. You know, I get a danger signal every time I roll with Joe. <laughs> I know I'm in. I know I'm in danger all the time. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I like to point to uh, uh, from this article promoting tissue adaptation with greater exposure. And basically, what happens is when we have an injury, we have damaged you know tissue or a joint or something you know. But let's just take we've we've damaged a muscle. We've we've pulled a, uh, you know, a, a hamstring. And basically what happens when you, you tear your muscle, uh, um, you know, that's going to lead to pain. It's going to lead to, uh, you know, lack of movement. It's going to lead to, uh, you know, just trouble performing your sport. And, uh, as time goes, it'll start healing, but it, it's not going to heal overnight. You start getting some scar tissue in there, you know, which is trying to, uh, you know, make it usable, um, but what happens is if, uh, you know, we end up going back too quick into a sport, you know, we haven't fully healed, we, we jump into a full force, we're putting too much of a load onto that muscle, onto that injur- injured area. And, um, you know, it's just going to basically get right back, you know, to where we were before. Um, you know, so we have to get to the point, we have to keep you know, doing a little bit and slowly working ourselves up. So we build up that tolerance, uh, at the injured site where we can produce high stress to it. So, um, uh, the big thing is, you know, take your time. Um, don't jump right back in and, uh, and put that high tolerance on that area or, you know, you could be back to square one. Gary, have you started to notice how much of this advice actually is directed at you? Actually, I don't think any of it. Um, yeah. Th- yeah. This, is not, this is not just a topic episode. This is an intervention, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> Have a seat. Um, yeah. But, you know, we go right back to what you were talking about, Joe. Um, this article goes on to talk about, you know, you should be continuing to do maintenance home program, you know, for prehab or to combat injury risk. And, you know, your maintenance could be getting a foam roller out to, uh, you know, get rid of that scar tissue it could be the ice and compression and elevation that you were just talking about joe so um um, we need to keep doing that um so we can heal and give greater stress to that injured area yeah uh it says in here as one of the greatest or one of the biggest predictors of injury in research is a previous injury so there will like uh, there will most likely be some soreness. Expect uh, rust in the gear. So like it's 
it's you don't want to re-injure the same thing because it wasn't quite ready or you, you were a little bit sore and went too hard or you were a little rusty and you didn't f- move as smoothly as you thought you would um it like i think that's pretty real one of the biggest predictors of of injury is where have you been injured before and uh look for ways to avoid that whether you just do something different if if every, you know, kind of like I guess with me with my triangle stuff, just do something different. I quit injuring my lower back when I quit triangling constantly. Um, and and uh, there, there's a lot of places to go in jujitsu that are totally different. I mean, if you are a deep half player, that is way different than, than somebody who does a smash passing game and, and, and wrestles for the top all the time. Like Those are two, it's almost like totally different sports. And if one of them is causing you injury, look into something else. You know, uh, I like what you're saying there, Byron. When you get stacked, is it normally the same side of your back, the same spot where you're getting injured? It's just lower back. I think. Okay. Yeah. Because I have a spot. Uh, it's on my lower right hand side, and it's always the same spot where I've never really been injured. Really, well, I guess the very first time, but I, I get little tweak injuries, and it's always that same spot, and. You know, so it just made me start thinking when you're talking about that with you getting stacked was always in the same spot. And then I was just thinking of this point, too, that we just went off, uh, you know, talking about prehab. And it makes me think that maybe I need to work on my flexibility, you know, of my back or or, you know, my hamstrings or because I and I wonder if it's on my my right hand side. My it seems like my hamstring is a little more flexible though on my right hand side but you know maybe it's an imbalance that's causing that um maybe i need to do more deadlifts you know slowly and work my way up to build that up um you know i was just thinking of two ways to prevent injuries you know you were talking about i'm not going to do triangles anymore but you know you're still going to get stacked every now and then so maybe if i you know do some maintenance or or build that area up and keep it flexible uh, you know it'll keep me on the mats there longer too yeah that's a good point gary i'm not i'm not avoiding the triangle because of anything in particular than just getting that lower pressure on my back but there's still other ways guys can put lower pressure on my back um and maybe maybe that's why i i play a lot of butterfly guard and I just don't even re- realize that because it's really hard to stack somebody from butterfly guard i mean it's not really what you do to that to address that guard. And I hadn't thought about that. I think that the big guy we were all with on Saturdays, Byron could stack you from butterfly guard. <laughs> Probably so. <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> he could pretty much do whatever <laughs> it needs to be done to me. Um, it does start to talk about uh, like the mental effects of dealing with an injury and, it's interesting because it's coming more from a coach's perspective and, and how that they want the athletes to be able to perform. And, and you could be watching uh, this, this athlete you know, doing these flips on a balance beam and that's where they fell or whatever. And you could tell if they're a little hesitating on things or they're not quite the same as they used to be. And it's not from injury. It's just from they're a little bit afraid of what's going to happen. Um, I think that's also a thing in jujitsu. Um, and I don't know if that's a bad thing either. <laughs> yeah, I had a, a friend, it's been about a year and a half ago now, he was uh, fighting a takedown while we were training, and somehow him and his training partner got tangled up. Uh, he broke his his uh, lower leg about four inches above the ankle. And I remember he's laying on the floor writhing in pain and, uh, for a minute, and I, I wasn't being judgmental of the guy. I was actually p- trying to give myself some optimism. I, I started thinking, well, maybe Travis just doesn't have that high of a threshold of pain. <laughs> he's rolling around, but he's probably not hurt that bad. And then he grabbed his, his knee and pulled it up towards him, so his foot came off the floor, and his foot was just kind of dangling at the end of his leg, and it's like, ah, shit. So, yeah, he, he broke both bones in his lower leg, dislocated his ankle, uh, had you know, a plate put in and screws and uh, he's back on the mats, but man, I, I spent some time thinking about that and that's got to be pretty sketchy. Then when you come back and you start doing takedowns again and, you know, he does a little recreational kickboxing and he said, man, the first time he threw a, a kick with that leg on a heavy bag, he was nervous as hell. So, um, 
Yeah, I'm, and the more serious injuries like that, I imagine there's quite a psychological hurdle to get over. Yeah, that that would be pretty intense. And, and this, I mean, things happen like that. And I wouldn't blame him at all if he just wanted to avoid takedowns for <laughs> who knows how long or, or just do <laughs> takedowns for uh, ways that aren't really that uh, the impact. Um, they don't create big impact. So, um, I, you know, I remember even being a white belt, getting thrown hard and then having the person that threw me land on me as well. So, like, boom, boom. I'm like... This throwing thing is kind of miserable. <laughs> and so still, like, if I'm going to try to do a throw, I'm always cautious that this person could also throw me because I my my understanding of, of the throws is, is fairly minimal, I guess, to where it probably should be. But just that, that you know, I don't know, I really wasn't injured, but getting that wind knocked out of me several times in probably, uh, you know, a day or two, it's just like, if this person, and it's the way it is, anybody who's that is significantly better at judo, when you go to throw them, they're going to go ahead and throw you instead. Like, I initiated this. It's like, could you imagine, Joe, doing an armbar on me, and then you get armbarred? Like, it doesn't really happen. But it happens with throws. It happens with my throws sometimes. So I'm I'm much more uh, the person who likes, um, like, a, a single leg takedown or or um, arm drags and things like that that don't foot sweep foot sweep I do foot sweeps are really fun um, but don't yeah, involve I hate it. risk I hate for me sweep. <laughs> so oh you love the foot sweep Gary all you gotta do Gary is one time foot sweep me when I'm foot sweeping you and I'll probably never do it again <laughs> well you know what I've actually thought about is finding a way to make my foot smaller which I think will make it harder for you to foot sweep me. You, you so do I'm working have, on that right now. Yeah, yeah, you have tiny feet anyway. I don't know what that says about so you that, as a person. <laughs> that would be a, <laughs> that would be another uh, fake uh, audio book. Yeah, we're just racking these up over here. Yeah, didn't Bilbo Baggins have huge <laughs> feet? <laughs> yeah, and Gary. I, mean, I I know they're easy to get a hold of, but I don't know if you could foot sweep that guy. That's a lot of contact with the floor and a lot of weight. I got my money that Byron could. Okay. Yeah. I'm looking forward to that super fight. Yeah, we'll do that next week. So I, you know, I urge you to check this article out. It's it's a lot more scientific than uh, than we really got into. We'd have to actually just read entire paragraphs or entire sections to make it uh, work and flow. But um, the yeah, big Byron, the big takeaway from here, yeah. Oh, I was going to say, finish. Go ahead, finish. No, a big takeaway is that um, a lot of coming back from injury is going to be some mental things. And and know that for yourself. Know that for teammates coming back. Like, you know, if if, if Gary got hurt, you know, doing um, his his, his uh, Brad Recluse sweep, um, and then he gets in that same spot again, and I know this, like, I, I should expect him to be a little bit... You know, he's testing the waters here, and he's seeing if he's um, able to do this and 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 to be a good teammate and and to to work with him. If he wants to do that Brian Recluse sweep again, that's up to him. And uh, and and if it was injury prone, maybe he shouldn't be doing that. But um, you know, switch to something like the like the uh, Black Widow or something like that would be better for him. But just just to expect. When, as a coach, when team when when team members come back, they might be a little hesitant to do things that involve their energy, which is not just normal, probably smart. Um, it, but to also look for ways to get around that, to get them to be, you know, if they do get full strength back, and they're still cautious of things, like you, know, you can do this, you know, your your, your doctor says you're 100. percent You know, you feel 100. percent There's no reason that, um, that that you can't attempt this thing. I don't know. <laughs> what were you going to say, Gary? No, yeah, that definitely makes sense, Byron. But you're talking about black widows, and I'm afraid of spiders. So I'm going to get on my bike and pedal over to the next uh, article, which is the sufferfest.com. And this is a biking article, uh, six steps to getting back on the bike after an injury. And uh, um, I, I love step number one. And I have trouble with this every time I get an injury, but acceptance, um, you know, it sucks to be injured. Um, you know, the, 
the author talks about you had big plans to crush mile after mile this year. You're going to, you know, ride the tour de France or whatever, but now you've got an accident, you're unable to ride and you're not happy about it. And, uh, you know, injuries happen, but what we have to do is, is get our head right and basically realize that there's no way I am going to be able to get uninjured. It's already happened. Um, it's in the past. And what happens with me is right off the bat, I get mad and, you know, my world's falling apart. Um, I can't train. This is the worst thing that's possibly happened. And, you know, I kind of go a little bit into despair. Um, my head, you know, is not in the right place. I start feeling sorry for myself. And, you know, I can even admit, I, I'll, I'll talk about real quick. One time I was training, this was probably about three or four years ago. And I was training with a really big guy. And, uh, I hadn't even warmed up and it was an open mat and I come back, I come in and I just start training with this guy. And I remember I was on the bottom and, you know, I did a brown recluse sweep and I got top <laughs> position and get this. So I'm in top mount, I'm in mount and this guy bumps. And as I try to stop his bump, I kind of posted with a leg and I just felt a big pop in my hip. And, um, you know, this is a time where it seems like I just had injury after injury. And I just remember getting up off the mat, you know, just being pissed. I want to talk to anybody and I just grabbed my stuff and left. And the whole way home, I just remember telling myself, I'm done with jujitsu. I'm, you know, just too many injuries. I'm not going to train anymore. And, uh, you know, when your head goes down, your, your mental state is down in despair like that. That's a, a bad place to be. Um, I ended up getting lucky. I had a, uh, buddy call me, um, you know, he was there and saw me leave and he called me and kind of talked me off the ledge. Um, but you need to accept this injury happened. You, there's nothing you can do. It's already happened. Um, you got to get into a better mood. You have to look at, um, you know, some positives on it. And, uh, basically, you know, studies have proven that if you have a positive attitude about recovery, you can return to normal activity faster than a person with a negative outlook. And, you know, like I said, I had a negative outlook. I had uh, a buddy of mine talk me off the cliff. Uh, let's get my, you know, outlook positive and, uh, you know, recover quicker. You know, don't feel sorry for yourself. Focus your energy into what you can do to heal up better. Um, but one thing that has worked for me is, you know, right off the bat, I do always get sad. You know, it's like I feel like my world's coming to an end. Um, I can't train jujitsu, which is what keeps me solid. Uh, you know, I need that jujitsu to have fun, to, to get rid of all my stress in life. And and I just enjoy it so much. So when it does get taken away from me, you know, I do fall into despair. And, you know, that lasts for like an hour and then I get my head on straight. But the one thing I always tell myself that while I'm injured, I seems like every time I'm injured, I come back better. Um, a lot of times I do need a, a break. Uh, you know, I, I normally don't take any breaks during the year unless I'm injured. I just keep going straight. And Byron and Joe will tell you when I'm injured, most of the time I do keep rolling. Um, but when I do take time off, it allows other parts of my body to heal. It allows me to watch some videos and, and you know, I'll keep watching those uh, about jujitsu on some area that maybe I'm working on. So even though I'm not on the mat, my mind is still training. My mind is still getting better. I'm, I'm focusing on activities that maybe I can get better uh, with. And I'm also cross training. So, you know, let's say I hurt my shoulder. I can still ride an exercise bike. I can still go ride my mountain bike if it's summertime. Um, there are stuff I can still do so my cardio doesn't take a beating when I get back. Uh, I can still work my core, uh, do do stuff for that. So when I do come back, all not all areas of my body are, are in bad shape. Um, you know, just uh, just have to work a little bit to get my cardio back up. So, man, I really love this acceptance one because this is one that has always hit me hard. And, um, and I really do believe a positive attitude goes a long way and will allow you to recover quicker. Yeah. Uh, on here it says, well, uh, first off, it says he's not a doctor. And so it's a disclaimer. Uh, neither are we. <laughs> and neither should, even if a doctor's on a podcast, listen to your own Byron. doctor. Byron. They know you. You are, you are a doctor of pain and Joe's a surgeon of submission. Oh, what does that make you? Uh, patient. 
<laughs> oh, Gary, I think you might have won the internet right there, man. Why, thank you. I've never won it before. Well, I've never awarded it either. But uh, he says, uh, be smart, or more precisely, don't be stupid. And he's talking about listening to your doctor and, and, and really using that person who is professional to get you back on the mats. And, you know, um, there's some value here. Like he said, okay, doctor says stay off the bike for six weeks. Stay off the bike for six weeks. That way you don't end up uh, getting hurt and re-injuring and making it more like eight weeks or nine weeks, um, you know, because you were not not only not smart, but you were being stupid. Um, th- there's definitely some value in talking to teammates, finding out doctors that specialize in sports and in and, and recovery and understand athletes. I know I've talked to Jake a couple times, and he's got – uh, a person he likes a lot, and the person knows, you know, really not about jiu-jitsu, but knows what Jake expects to happen, um, you know, his goals, his body. So he doesn't get the talk. You shouldn't be doing jiu-jitsu. You got hurt doing that. Do something else. Um, he gets, okay, how can we get you back to doing what you want to do um, physically? And, and and that's a different conversation that not all doctors understand, um, you know, why we, we do jiu-jitsu. And it's not even worth explaining it to them sometimes, but... Because uh, it's just they're busy, they don't want to hear it anyway, and and you're you're getting hurt doing something. So just stop doing that thing that's making you hurt. Well, also it's it's helping us be uh, you know more fit and 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 active athletically and and that sort of thing. So there's give and take, but ultimately jujitsu should be making you a more healthy person, and and part of that is listening to your doctor. Find a good one that will help you reach your goals and not uh, have you avoid things you want to do. Yep. Uh, number number three is take care of yourself. And I hadn't really thought about this too much, but it makes sense. So if you're a, a, do a jujitsu, go into the gym, maybe you work out in the mornings, you do other things. Part of your training helps keep you in a routine, and that's part of what helps keep you healthy and 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 staying on your diet, getting enough rest, and all that kind of stuff. And when you get injured, if you're off your routine for any significant amount of time, it can throw everything off. And then if you add to that, that like Gary said, you're depressed and you're down in the dumps because uh, you're missing jujitsu for a while. That's when you should be taking the best care of yourself. But you can find yourself in your underwear at two in the morning in front of the TV with a tub of ice cream, you know, cause you're, you're depressed and, 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 and then you're just going down the wrong road. And it, I guess it happens to people. Uh, you, you start, you quit hydrating like you should. You're not getting the sleep. You should, you're not eating the way you should. Cause that, that part of your life that has helped with all that is now on the sidelines while you're recovering. So make sure if you're in a position where you can't be exercising, can't be working out that you don't just let everything go to, Hell in a handbag, so to speak. Hey, excuse me, guys. I just threw up in my mouth a little bit here, uh, thinking about Joe uh, in his underwear at 2 a.m. with a tub of ice cream. So uh, sorry about that. Oh, come on, Gary. Uh, you know, the crazy thing is, as we go over these, like I'm going to step number four, uh, ease yourself back into training. These are the same. Every article is exactly the same. And so it just makes me think that, we need to, I need to take more advice. Uh, you know, all these ease yourself back into training. I have a habit of, you know, coming back full blast and, uh, end up hurting myself more, but, uh, you know, returning to training doesn't mean, you know, going full blast. Um, uh, you know, we kind of talked about a little bit before, maybe instead of doing six rounds, do two rounds and, and pick a high level training partner that'll allow you to go a little bit slower and just work on technique. Um, you know, maybe you're still, you know, want to be careful with your back and, you know, let's say you have a back injury, maybe you want to be in top position, you know, express that to your training partner. Hey, I'm coming back off an injury. Is it okay if I just work top when I'm on the bottom and I try to use my hooks, it kind of aggravates my back just a little bit and uh, I don't want to do it. So make sure you get a good training partner and ease yourself back into it. Yeah. Towards the end of the article, he says, uh, taking a step back and allowing yourself to fully recover is the hard part. You need to embrace your recovery and think of it as an ultimate training goal. Um, so that's part of it. It's just we, we talk about just being a journey. Sometimes in your journey, you end up kind of getting injured or, or banged up a little bit. And uh, you got to find ways to bounce back. That's part of it. 
You know, uh, step six, and this one doesn't really apply to you, Byron, because it's a little different. Step six says getting back in the saddle. And uh, for Byron, it would say step six, getting back on the pole. Um, Byron does not, you know, use a seat when he rides. He just uh, just has a seat post there. And Joe and I can attest to that. We've rode with him before, and it's uh, a little bit creepy. <laughs> And I thought you were talking about the pole at work, you know, Byron. <laughs> no, no, nope. I guess we could call it post, getting back on the post. Because, uh, like I said, Byron doesn't use a seat. He just sits on the seat post. Yeah, uh, I don't, I, I'm defenseless here, Gary. I got, I got nothing to that. Uh, but you know what he's talking about. Uh, you know, you are now back, and you can get back on the saddle. You can start – start. Uh, 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 doing jujitsu or, you know, riding your bike, um, you know, wrap things up slowly. And Joe, you talked about it earlier. You're, you're not going to be in the same shape, uh, when you come back. And, you know, I kind of like, uh, one thing this author was talking about, you know, he's talking about riding and what he does, uh, to get back, uh, you know, if he just tries to go his regular miles at his regular pace, you know, he's just going to end up killing himself. So he does, uh, what he calls tempo efforts. He does six minutes on four minutes off or seven minutes on three minutes off. And, uh, I, I thought that's a great way to do it. You're, you're, you know, still, you know, taxing your muscles, but you're not totally killing yourself. And, uh, so he probably starts at six minutes on four minutes off, does that for a, a couple of sessions and goes to seven and three and, uh, finally gets himself where he's, uh, riding, uh, back like he used to, but, you know, transition back into it slowly. Yeah. I could, I sometimes, you know, start back two minutes on a uh, 10 minute break followed by, um, a shower and getting ready to do something else. Um, you know, start slow. <laughs> yeah. You gotta, well, I, well, I like that. You know, you go two minutes on the seat post and, you know, because when you're coming <laughs> that's back, more than enough, you, Gary. Don't, you don't want to spend a ton of time on it. You're easing, no pun intended, your way back into it. I, I put that on the tee for you. And sure enough, hit right off that tee. <laughs> I hit that one right into the fairway. Uh, so lists, we have another article. Uh, three components to coming back stronger from injuries, and this one, I, I really liked it. It's it ha- it says a lot of good things in here. It's more about um, uh, physical, you know, weight training and that sort of thing, and getting getting back, um, not just where you were, but actually stronger. And uh, it, I think there's a lot of good stuff in here, guys. Did you get a chance to check this one out? I, I did. Um... Two, two things. First, uh, this article got me thinking that the psychological effect is going to be different for different people. Uh, this article is written, um, so it opens up with uh, this uh, person tore her radial ulnar tendon during a lift. She was at a competition uh, and she was on pace to make the national team and was attempting a heavy clean and jerk. So, um, when I get injured, which I, I don't really get injured, I get nicked a little bit and, and take a few days off. But I, I'm not a 28 year old purple belt who thinks I could be a black belt in a couple of years and I could win worlds and I can open my own gym. And, um, you know, I'm not on a five year plan like some people are. I think that's when our teammates get injured. I think that's something to be uh, sort of sensitive of just to be aware of that. But um I like the first point in the article it says never stop training. And I think we talked in the last one of article, like you can kind of slip into some depression and, and some unhealthy habits. And this is certainly a way to combat, combat that. So if you hurt your shoulder, get on the exercise bike, you know, do some sit-ups. If you hurt your, your knee, you know, do some upper body exercises, but uh, yeah, you can't necessarily work the injured area. We talked about being smart. But you can always, I guess, find a way to work out and find a way to train. Yeah, I, I like that, Joe. That's a great point. And I also like, uh, you know, the author who is actually Maya's father, you know, talking about when she tore the radial, uh, whatever, radial ulna ten, ulnar tendon. I'm not even sure where that is. but um, uh, Somewhere near like the it. upper lower middle part. Okay. <laughs> There you go. But I, I, you know, what you were talking about, Joe, keep training. And, you know, I like where he told the story that, uh, 
you know, as they were talking to specialists, they said, we'll do, we'll take whatever time it was necessary to get to back to 110%. And, you know, the specialist was kind of shocked. Uh, you know, normally I don't hear that. Normally the athletes want to rush back. And, uh, you know, their game plan was they would keep training, but they would only do stuff that didn't cause Maya pain. You know, they weren't sitting on the couch doing nothing or eating a, uh, a tub of ice cream, as Joe says. They were uh, they were immediately back in the gym training any part of her body that didn't cause Maya pain. I, I really like that. I thought that was awesome. Joe, what are you watching at 2 in the morning? Like old movies or infomercials or what's on when you're when you're eating that ice cream? He's watching West Coast Grappling reruns. No, Billy May, baby. <laughs> <laughs> the sham. I'm buying a sham. Wow. <laughs> Joe's Joe now because he's got a snuggie order. Now can you wear a snuggie to make sure the ice cream doesn't drip onto his chest? So uh, he's he bought a snuggie. So, yeah. Hey, did you did you see my new blanket I got for Christmas, Gary? I loved it. I did. That see was that. pretty nice. That uh, was my, awesome. My wife's pretty considerate gift giver. I liked it. Literally, Gary, yeah, you literally hit the like button. So, speaking of injury avoidance, um, what did you guys get your wives for Christmas this year? <laughs> <laughs> That's good, injury avoidance. Yeah. Yes. I think my main gift was uh, uh, some earrings, and then I got her something when we were on our vacation that she didn't want to buy herself because it was too expensive, so I snuck off and bought it, and it'll surprise her. But Wait, wait, though, Byron. You got her earrings. Yeah. You actually gave her your earrings. No, no. You just re-gifted him. Byron, if you guys don't know, Byron is a big earring wear. He's always... <laughs> <laughs> My ears and are not so... very scary. <laughs> it's funny. As I defend it, it, wouldn't be so bad. it wouldn't be so bad if they were the diamond studs, but he looks pretty ridiculous with those hooped earrings on. I tried yeah. to go with the pirate. Yeah, I can't, can't get him to take them out. You can't even get him to take him out while he's rolling half the time. Yeah, and it's terrible. You know, you next thing you know, you get your hand caught in it, or you know, you rip his earlobe off. But uh, it's terrible. But the nice thing is, after all these articles, maybe Byron will take some time off next time his earlobe gets ripped off. Maybe. Yeah, I I don't. So if if I'm getting her jewelry, she has already seen it. So she will go to look at jewelry sometimes, and she'll say, "Oh, I like this one. I like this one. I like this one." And then I'll take little notes, and then I'll be able to get one of those because I don't like to buy jewelry and she doesn't I mean if she doesn't like jewelry that I get her she'll let me know which is nice but I don't just go in and buy something uh, that is pretty specific to someone's personal taste I'm not good at that so give me some guidance and she does that and the other gift I got her was just she wanted it she was like real torn about it it was more expensive than she thought you know she should pay for something and so I got that for her she didn't know about it how about you You, Gary what did you you get uh, I don't give my wife anything. I'm I'm smart. <laughs> I'm gonna get beat up. <laughs> yeah, but no, Byron. I just thought you could have made a big mistake. This article or this uh, episode won't air until after Christmas. I know. But Becky may actually listen. You know, go up to your recording room and actually listen to this episode beforehand, and know she's getting a used pair of your earrings. Um, so. Uh, you you better make sure you hide this really well. The key to the key to and, giving and, you and right is right now, the box. Byron's think right now. Byron's thinking no, my wife wouldn't go up and listen to the recording before it aired. Byron, she she messages Gary and I all the time. She's like, you got to bring Byron and check. I don't know what he was talking about midway through that episode. So <laughs> we get a lot of valuable feedback from her. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. good. No, hey, you guys got to do what I do. Is I'm getting my wife a. Couple pairs of grappling shorts and two or three rash guards, all in my size. <laughs> my wife does not do jujitsu, and the great thing is that she'll end up giving it to me. So works perfect. I, I have given my wife a gi for either her birthday or Christmas, and she wears it sometimes. Perfect. So that worked out okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, now that Byron has derailed this article, yeah, I did. Uh, let's let's get back to point number two. Uh, Rebuild the full range of motion. And, um, you know, the old scar tissue uh, can destroy you. 
Um, so when you get injured, you uh, will build up scar tissue in that area. And, and normal muscle fibers, you know, they kind of go straight across. And scar tissue is your body's way of, you know, healing really quick and trying to make it stronger. And the 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 muscle tissues are kind of like zigzagged. Um, you know, they're not just smooth and straight across. And but it, it makes it strong. Uh, you know, so that you can keep uh, keep walking or whatever you need to do. So, um, but it, that scar tissue will, uh, decrease your range of motion. It'll, which, you know, is not going to be beneficial. You know, you take Maya's, uh, what she needs to do that clean and jerk. She needs to be able to, if she's got a sh- shoulder injury, she needs to be able to put her arm over her head, um, uh, you know, to, to do the jerk phase or, you know, doing snatches or whatever she's doing. But, um, uh, you know, so you need to, uh, increase that range of motion. Uh, you know, if you're injured bad, you're probably going to go be seeing a physical therapist and kind of like what Joe says, you need to do what that person prescribes. And there's probably going to be a lot of stretching, a lot of moving, uh, you know, with, with light weight or no weight moving through full range of motion, um, probably foam rolling to break up that scar tissue. But, um, you know, the big thing is, uh, to, 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 excel at your sport, we're going to need full range of motion and that'll also, uh, keep injuries at bay in the future there also speaking of full range of motion um so the author put a hyperlink in the article and it's uh, for an anatomy book it's called the body movable blueprints of the human Mus- musculoskeletal system its structure mechanics locomotor and postural functions that's pretty heavy but anyway it's an anatomy book um if you want to know more about this stuff, sometimes we're just shooting in the dark and we're just guessing. But there are all kinds of uh, resources out there to educate yourself. And for anybody who's really interested in this, you know, picking up a, a decent anatomy book might be a good idea. Yeah, that's a good idea, Joe. And so this article has three, <laughs> I mean, if, that, if that's interesting, you step on that gas pedal and go and dive into that. You'll be quickly an expert in something that most of us <laughs> couldn't even get through reading. Like that's uh, anatomy books are pretty tough. <laughs> I couldn't hardly read the title of the book. There you go. <laughs> uh, so component one and is never stop training. That's, that's fairly simple. We don't always, uh, you can't always just train on the mat, but, but do something physical, be active, do something that doesn't involve your injury. So you stay in shape. Component two, rebuild to the full range of motion. So you're doing that uh, physical therapy. You're getting back to to where you were as far as that full range of motion. Because if you stop shy of that, um, I think that the chances of re-injury are greater because, you know, your shoulder's really tight now and it's not where it used to be. Well, a tight shoulder is more likely injured than a shoulder that has a full range of motion. And, and the third component Get the injured area as strong as steel, and and I think Gary knows uh, he's seen this done before. <laughs> uh, Gary, yes. How would you get an injured area as strong as steel? How would I make the injured area as strong as steel? Yeah. Well, okay. I just threw you a, a curveball, I guess. So um, he says, if you put twelve weak kids and twelve strong kids on the football field. Who do you think would be most likely to get injured? <laughs> yes, the weak kids are going to get injured. So just being fit, being strong, being being an athlete will decrease your chances of injury. Now, to get there, you have to train smart. You have to lift uh, you know, smart. You have to build your muscle in a smart and safe way because you could just as easily get injured lifting weights as doing you know, jiu-jitsu or any other sport. Probably not gymnastics. Gymnastics get injured easier. Uh, but... Uh, if you look at people, you get you look at two people grappling. You can almost tell this person is more likely injured than that one. Uh, you know, all all things other than that being equal, being more fit, being more flexible, being stronger uh, protects you against some injuries. And he talks about uh, what was that, a golfer or a tennis player? I can't remember the. Uh, it, actually, both golfers okay. and tennis players. I thought it was kind of cool that. Uh, you know, he'll have his golfers and tennis players do a double body weight squat. You know, he's he's heard about, you know, some of the parents and some of the coaches in those sports say, you know, hey, a golfer or a tennis player, you know, baseball players don't need to be strong. And, and I love what he says. He's like in big, bold points. I totally disagree. And, uh, you know, that's uh, 
uh, he wants those athletes, his tennis players, his golfers, uh, his baseball players to, if they weigh 150 pounds to be able to squat 300 pounds, he wants them strong. He wants them flexible. He wants, you know, them to, you know, to, to be strong and flexible where they're going to perform much better. Yeah. And during the final takeaway here, he says, instead of, uh, you know, complaining about your sorrows and feeling sorry for yourself, take this opportunity to work on your athlete's weakness. Eat correctly. Uh, it's a major factor in recovery. High performance machines need high performance fuels. Uh, when you break it down, sports is a game of inches or millimeters and a crappy meal could, uh, lead to a bad night's sleep, which could lead to you not performing well, which could lead to, you know, from a, going from a gold to a bronze just because you didn't sleep well. And uh, all of these things, uh, you know, we didn't really even talked about it this until just now. Um, eating correctly, building, you know, if it's a muscle injury, you need some protein to help build muscle back. If you're, if you've changed your, your workout routine, you might, you know, if you go from a mostly a jiu-jitsu style of, of workout to, you know, I'm going to hit the weights a little bit because I could at least build up my leg strength while my neck is getting, you know, uh, he recovered. Um, you know, add some more uh, protein, gain some gain some muscle in your legs during that time. That would be great. Uh, right, Gary? You can't have chicken legs all your life. You can't have chicken legs all your life. You, you do have to be able to double your body weight squat. Um, Talk but- about eating chicken legs. Oh, I'll eat chicken wings. All right. Yep. But I like if it was easy, everyone would do it. You know, he's talking about uh, like, you know, you said, Byron, uh, the eating part. But it made me start thinking, uh, you know, he's talking about are you really doing everything you can to be, you know, to get on that podium or, or whatever you want to do? You know, if it, it's really your goal, are you really doing everything possible? So. Let's just talk about, I can tell you all, well, Byron, I think you eat pretty well, but I know I don't. I don't know about Joe, but let's say I'm injured and I really can't train much at all. And, you know, this is where I'm saying maybe I'm watching some videos, I'm, you know, doing whatever the doctor prescribes me to do, you know, on mobility or, or stretching. But, you know, what I could do is during that time I'm off is really what, you know, work on my eating. So first of all, I'm going to be working out less. So, you know, I got a chance to put some weight on, uh, which is not good. But, you know, the other part is, let's say I'm eating out four days a week and I'm, you know, eating ice cream and, you know, even at home, I don't have good eating habits. But so let's say I'm out really for six weeks. I can really focus on my eating, which is going to help me heal. Like Byron says, if I'm eating good protein, it's going to help me heal. But by the time I get back on the mat, maybe I have now made a habit that I'm eating better. Um, So now not only can I train and I'm, you know, doing my rehab and I'm hitting my weights and I'm training my jujitsu or whatever sport I'm doing. But now because of my injury, I have now created a habit of eating well. I am just going to be that much better. Um, so maybe the next time I do get injured and I'm out, maybe I'll focus on my eating habits and, uh, you know, during that time and, uh, instead of normally what I do and, you know, heal quicker and maybe it'll be a long term uh, 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 habit change for me. Gary, that reminds me of something. That's a great point, uh, about developing better habits when you've got the time to just focus on other things. But another kind of option is, I don't know if you remember, we had Nick Unander on the show a while ago, and he'd had that uh, heart irregular beat that had him off the mats for a while. And uh, for a guy like that, you know, he, he's teaching, he's, I mean, jiu-jitsu is his life, so um, he had some spare time on his hands, and that's kind of when you can slip into maybe some bad thought patterns or depression. That guy taught himself to learn how to, he taught himself to play guitar while he was off <laughs> awesome. the mats. You know, so that, that's another option. Just keep your brain busy. Awesome. Yeah, study a foreign language, pick up an instrument, you know, just do something positive, I think. Yeah. And Joe, you know, I want to go right back to you. And, you know, I don't know how many of our listeners know, but Joe is 52 years young. You know, he does jujitsu. And Joe also plays the guitar, which I just found out a little while ago. You know, I thought that was pretty unique. But, you know, another thing is Joe is really big into skateboarding. And uh, it's just cool seeing uh, Joe at 52. You know, I see some videos of him out there skateboarding, you know, got a smile on his face. You see his grandson out there skateboarding with him. And, uh, you know, it just 
it, Joe, you have a, a cool mindset, you know, kind of like Nick there. You know, if you want to learn something, you do it. You know, you, you're you like, hey, I'm going to learn to play the guitar. Or I'm going to learn to skateboard. And Joe hadn't skateboarded his whole life. It's something he had picked up later in life. And, uh, Joe, it's kind of cool to see that. You, know, you, you are an inspiration to us a uh, little bit older uh, individuals. And you, you walk the walk. You show that it can be done. I know a lot of people say, you know, at 50, I can't do jujitsu. Uh, Joe shows it at 50. I can uh, 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 ride a skateboard. You know, that's a young person's game. Joe shows it. So, uh, you know, kudos to you, Joe, uh, leading us old guys and showing us that anything can be done. Well, every now and then I, I bust my ass on that skateboard and am reminded that it really is a young man's game. But. <laughs> <laughs> a little more patty back there helps. Yeah, but the one yeah. thing Joe does is, you know, he used to bust his ass and it would hurt a little bit. But what he does now is he wears one of those sumo suits, those uh, uh, blow up sumo suits when he's skateboarding. And that way, when he falls, he just pops right back up and has no injuries. So that was the way to think outside the box, Joe. Yeah, you know, and if I if I'm someplace where I can't get a sumo suit, I just run to the UPS store and I pick up a roll of uh, <laughs> bubble wrap and you know, that, that works pretty good in a pinch. Yeah, I like that. And the pinch was the key word. <laughs> Man. Okay. Guys, this episode's going a little longer than, than typical. So uh check out all those articles. I'll put links to all of them in the show notes. Um they each have different At- components and, and, and they're all really pretty well written as far as um not stuff that we're seeing typically in jiu-jitsu, but stuff that like shades of stuff, but it's just from a different angle, which kinda helps explain things to me. Yeah, and what I liked about all these articles, they really all about said the same thing. And even our jujitsu articles that we've talked about, they all say the same thing. So we just have to take that advice. It's it's universal what works and what doesn't work. But now on to the article of the week. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not do that, Carrie. We've got an our article to out, my friend. <laughs> I was kidding. <laughs> uh, instead of that, how about this? We'll do a, a little question see if you guys have anything you want to say. This is the last episode of the year. It's been a good year uh, for the, both the podcast, you know, and, and for Jitsu and, and – uh, so, is there a favorite thing you guys have learned uh, about jiu-jitsu this year? I, let me take this one first. Um, you know, Byron, it was you. Um, you know, showing, uh, uh, you know, on your back control seminar. My back control, to be honest, was garbage. Um, and your back control seminar, I have spent some time working. Um, and really, I... You know, I didn't, what I worked on is just control. You know, your back control, I could care less if I get a rear naked choke out of it. I could care less if I get an arm bar out of it or, or whatever. And, you know, I just focused on working control. I, I focused on my head position. I focused on, you know, my, my legs controlling your hips, you know, I focused on getting that bottom leg up high, uh, focused on using that second leg to control your hips, depending on what way you want to move. And, uh, it has made a big difference in my game. And, um, it has made, uh, my training, my main training partner is also doing that. So we start every round for probably the last six months on each other's back and we just go back and forth. And, uh, and it has changed my game offensively for the control and defensively. I feel like I'm a lot better getting out. Um, Byron, you had very good, you have very good back control and I used to hate being in your back control. And because I've worked it so much offensively and defensively, I am now not as scared to get in your back control, but I'm still scared of the black widow and, uh, the brown recluse, um, and, uh, you know, I know a lot of times you lead me into the funnel web, so I, I am afraid of those, but, um, uh, that's what I've learned and, and has really helped me out. Uh, my favorite thing I've learned this year in jujitsu. Glad, glad that you enjoyed that, Gary. That means, thank you, man. It means a lot. I wonder how many people think we really do a funnel web and people are probably looking up on, you know, what's funnel web Brazilian jujitsu, black widow Brazilian jujitsu. Probably nobody. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Hopefully, hope. that, that, that'd be my guess. Yeah. It's all explained within the episode itself. It's contained because we started with uh, if we joke about it in two weeks and don't explain that we thought Spider Guard should have some spiders named after it, then it, yeah. then then people might think about it. 
Yeah. Joe, what about you? You know, I, I, I think it's just going to be kind of the last thing I learned more than my favorite thing. You just, you learn so much in a year. So I don't, I don't know if this is like the best thing I learned this year, but I've been watching Lachlan Giles uh, body lock passing series lately. And I, I don't know that, and this is what I like about jujitsu. I don't know that that specifically locking the body and doing the pass the way he does it is necessarily going to end up being in my game. But I do a lot of like uh, a leg weave, you know, smash the knees together when my opponent has been half guard. And, um, you know, I do a lot of pressure passing. And the details that Lachlan has in that thing as far as head positioning and, and weight distribution. And, I mean, it's, it's just really golden. It, it pretty much can be applied to any type of uh, pressure passing. So I think kind of working some details out in that recently is probably the highlight of what I learned this year. That's cool, and that yeah, that is a good instructional uh, there on BJJ Fanatics, and uh, I'm working on that one as well. <laughs> it's uh, he, I, I like his style of teaching. Um, for my thing, it's just been the transition to um, to focusing on back control, like like kind of like Gary was saying. But it's just it's just changed my game. I think the year before I was I was more of a of a guillotine uh, headhunter. I guess would be a way to say it. Like I wanted a guillotine. And so it didn't really require me to do any particular position. I could do it from, from guard. I could do it from top guard. I can do it from half guard top, uh, bottom half guard, I mount or side control. I, I was looking to guillotine. And I still will, will wrap up the head sometimes. But I'll, many times when I'm rolling, I'm looking to get uh, to the back just because it's, it's so efficient and, and, it, and it's such a, such a good spot to be. So the idea that I constantly want to improve my position until I get to that position which is basically the best position um that that's kind of the goal or that's kind of just like the direction that that I that I send my jiu-jitsu and I don't always roll that way but um yeah you better believe it if I'm in a in a competitive role and the, and I'm looking to take the back whether whether it happens or not I'm I'm always looking for the opportunity because it gets a lot easier when you're back there and and some techniques you know some of, uh, looking at John Danaher's uh, stuff on on back attack and and going back and looking at Ryan Hall's uh, uh, back attack series that he had and and just getting online and, and talking with teammates and Gary showed me one of the coolest uh, grip breaks uh, that I had seen like that he did to me I'm like how come you do that so easily and he just showed me a little detail about uh, how to capture that arm I'm like man. I I was doing it wrong, so uh, just just making minor, minor adjustments and getting kind of deep into that is where my game has gone in the past year or so. So uh, it's been it's been good, and and I, I think it's important, you know, as we all talk about these things, is they take time. I you know I don't know how long you've been working on the uh, that pass, Joe. How long has that been? Well, uh, that type of passing is sort of the core of my top game so for a long time um and then it's nice if when you've been working on something for a long time uh that there's just still always so much more to learn you know and um it's nice when you can borrow from somebody that's doing something slightly different but there's so many things that fit yeah so give it if you want to work on a certain area of your game don't give it a, a one day training session or even a week you know, hopefully after a month you've seen progress in that and that'll get you going in the right direction. But you could, you could easily spend, I could be saying the same thing next year, still working on back attacks, still working on taking the back whenever I can. I, I think I worked on my guillotines well over a year and, uh, same thing. <laughs> I don't know how long I worked on my rubber guard and my triangles, but it was probably more than a year each, but <laughs> that may not be the best way to look at it, but find the area you want to get better and, and start working on that. And, and any time that we're, you know, a new year is a time, kind of a time for self-reflection. And, you know, is your game going to where you want it to go? Uh, try to answer that yourself. Maybe talk to your coach. What should I be working on this year? Maybe they'll give you some good guidance because I'm going to have some conversations with some of my teammates. Like some of them have really good top games and they absolutely refuse to play guard. Uh, th- th- that's just a conversation because – uh, whether I can sweep them or not, they need to be on their back playing guard. So, hey, play guard. Let's do this. You know, let's work on finding you at least a guard or two that, that works well for you, even though it's not your favorite thing or you're not comfortable there. And it'll be guard, pass, regard, and like, we'll just do this until you get, get the game developed. 
So ask your coaches, ask your teammates, where should you be working? It may be uh, you know, fixing some of your weaknesses, and it may be making some of your strengths even stronger. There's a lot of value in doing either one of those activities. So here's another highlight from this year for me. Um, I had a couple of roles last week with some white belts and uh, in- encountered some like pleasant surprises during the role. So an example is rolling with a guy um, and he's in mount and he slides up to technical mount and, you know, I'm just kind of being patient watching what he's doing and putting up some defense and, and I'm anticipating the arm bar and he transitions to a back take and it's like, Oh, that's nice. You know? And uh, my coach has always been, um, like if, if he's going to have us drill a, a move from side control, we'll always start in some type of guard, do a guard pass, and then do the move. I mean, he's just always focusing on transitions, and he's always focusing on training smart. He's told the class several times, you know, the key is that you guys train smart. If you haven't figured that out yet, don't worry. I'm training smart for you. And he's always trying to have a program that helps develop this kind of thing. And so uh, when I'm rolling with white belts who have not been training that long and like Three or four times last time I was home, uh, I was sure they were going to do an arm bar or shoot a triangle, and it turns into an OMA plot or something else. And to me, it's just really exciting to see guys getting to that point really early in their jujitsu journey. Yeah, that's cool, I, it, and that does that speaks to quality of training and getting and getting. Uh, better at teaching jujitsu guys. I want to mention our Patreon support uh, team that we have highlight a couple of, of the members, uh, Joseph and Bogdan. Thank you for the support uh, that you ha- that you've given us on Patreon. Uh, what it is is you could go, uh, to, there's a link in the show notes and pledge uh, per episode, like a dollar or two or three, whatever you think is, uh, amount that you're comfortable with. And uh, in, at the end of the month, the pledges are automatically collected and it goes to help su- support the show, keep us up on the air, uh, you know, get us our equipment when we need it, and and uh, and, and get us uh, here every week. And Patreon has been a big uh, supporting factor with this, um, it, that and the audiobooks. But as I've moved the audiobook to the store, it does sell a little less because it's a little harder to get to. <laughs> but I don't... The the idea of that was I when I when somebody posts um, a link to our podcast, a lot of times the audiobook image would show up and it would drive me nuts. I want the picture of the person to show up. Sometimes that happens now. Sometimes the podcast image shows up, which is not as bad as the advertisement. Um, so a little less money driven, but, uh, if you're wanting the audiobook, you got an extra click to do. You got to go to the store. And if you want to support us on Patreon, um, go through it and set that up. We really appreciate it. We'll be at a five inch BJJ brick gi patch. We still have a couple of the older gi patches left. So we'll send you two in the mail and then uh, also send you out a sticker. Uh, new members of the Patreon support team, uh, please join our private Facebook group. Send me an email at bjjbrick at gmail.com asking to join the private group and I'll get you added into that. And it's a little behind the scenes discussion sometimes and, and uh, it's just fun way to connect on a more personal level there. So uh, thank you guys for the support. Absolutely. We couldn't do it without you guys. Couldn't do it without everybody listening to I'm I enjoy spending an hour a week talking to Byron and Gary, but <laughs> mostly me. <laughs> yeah. But, but we do it for the listeners. Yeah. It, it, that, that's, that's well said. Uh, next week, guys, we have Marty Malloy on the show for an interview. Uh, she was on the uh, United States Olympic team, took bronze. And uh, so it's just kind of a cool thing to, to catch up with a high-level judo practitioner. And uh, she uh, shares a lot of uh, insight about what's behind, you know, in the judo scene and what's going on and, 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 and developing her, her skill as a, as a martial artist up until that, you know, to the peak of competing in the Olympics and how she did that. So she shares a really cool story. So I'm excited to bring that to you guys next week. But until then, stay sweaty, my friends. And don't forget to shower and always keep your seat on your bike. Yeah, so uh, train hard, uh, train smart, and get better, guys. We'll see you on the mats. Thank you for listening. I hope you find the time today to roll. After all, 
the best way to get better at Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is to do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu.